Today's speaker is Dr. David Lawa. David is the senior director of, is a senior director of product management. He leads Sertara's scientific informatics group and has responsibility for the D360 scientific informatics platform. He earned a doctor of philosophy degree from Oxford University and holds a first class honors degree in chemistry from Oxford University. Dave, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin the presentation. and an ability to think and understand quickly. And more specifically, in terms of research, the ability of data to flow from experiment into decision making and research is really the key to being agile. If we think about this a little more specifically in terms of research, then there are two key aspects to it. The first one is speed, and that's getting data from an experimental situation to the scientists who are going to make the decisions based on that, and especially in near real time. We'll talk a little more detail about this in a few slides, and we'll take a look at some particular case studies here as well. The second part, which I think is almost more important, is flexibility. And flexibility, again, is the hallmark of smaller organizations. They are able to switch and change direction much more rapidly than perhaps larger organizations. And that's a real key to being agile in your research processes. So as a scientist working in um, drug discovery research, what do we want? So the first part of this is I want to get my data available. I want my data as soon as it's available from experimentation. So if that data is not made available in a sensible and simple to consume way, the data will find a way to make its way from the experimenter to the person making the decisions, whether that's from an outside an external research organization or whether it's from an internal group. But all of a sudden, regardless of what infrastructure you've put in place, if that infrastructure does not support rapid transit of the data to decision makers, then all of a sudden you'll be back to square one and Excel spreadsheets will start moving through email and the data will get lost. And when people try and aggregate and assimilate that data, errors will be made. And the time taken to get that data is still going to be slow. So getting data is a really key aspect and especially as soon as it's available. We also need that data to be presented in an expected and desired format. That means the data must be aggregated with an appropriate function, perhaps a geometric mean or an arithmetic mean, but also looking at standard deviations and the like. But it also must be presented in an appropriate way that fits the science. That means looking at the right precision or significant figures of the data. It means the ability to get not only from a piece of aggregated data, but to the underlying so that quality can be assessed. And this is something that really should be automated and based on standards. However, it needs to be adjustable as well. Not every experiment is the same. And so we want some standards to get the data right most of the time. But when an experiment is different, then we need to be able to adjust that. And again, this is all to do with the speed of getting to the data. But we also see now some tending into the ability to switch direction. The third key point here is just the number of applications on the desktop. So there are many, many applications that can be used from data capture systems to reporting systems to analysis applications. And you don't really want to have to know four or five plus different applications to get the data and to generate that right view. There's a huge learning curve for all of this. What is really required is a hub so you know where to get to the data. And that hub should provide you basic analysis capabilities. But if you want to go further, it should be very straightforward to get that data out into the relevant application. So again, we want the fewer applications, but they need to satisfy the workflow. Um, 
Penultimately, we also need to allow researchers to ask their own questions of the data. So in our experience with discovery, especially in small molecules, but increasingly in, in biologics, we see that um, although a standard view is the ability to get to um, a standard project view of data, you have a wealth of data that might be extraneous to the project that is now um, you want to ask questions of. Certainly, larger organizations have a, have a distinct wealth of data, that's their plus point. But even if you've only got a relatively small amount of data over a couple of projects, it's very important that the users can ask their own questions because it might be that a problem solved in one project is applicable to your own. So standard data views tend to be the stable, but the ability to ask your own questions, but also to easily adapt those data views is really key. And the last one that we've seen in a number of places is the fact that people don't generally want to be dependent on others in order to get their data. So whereas in larger organizations, there might be a significant IT group who could help with data manipulation and data access, um, in smaller organizations, those groups tend to be um, non-existent or, or very small and very often overworked. So we've seen smaller organizations that will fire up projects and get assays, um, but even with the data moving in, for example, Excel spreadsheets and people having to manipulate that data and produce data views for scientists, sometimes those projects are killed very early before that data has really had a chance to be analyzed appropriately. So these are kind of the key things that, that scientists really need, and we've seen this again and again, and sometimes at larger organizations, but particularly at smaller ones, where the informatics environment is maturing. So what is needed really to maintain this agility? Well, this is a kind of mirror of the last points we just made. So the first and foremost is making sure the experimental data is available as soon as it's created. Any delay in this means you've got a scientist who knows the data is available somewhere and will do their utmost to go and get it. But that's time consuming, tedious, and not what people want to do, and is still slower than it being made immediately available. We also need to think about automated application of standard data transformations. This means when a compound or a substance is tested multiple times, it should be presented with the right kind of transformation, the right kind of aggregation, and also the right kind of formatting. There's nothing uh, sillier than having a well-educated, experienced scientist doing things like changing precision and values. So we want those kind of things to be able to be set up once and then presented quickly in an automated fashion to users. Um, but of course, with this kind of thing, there's always the need to override these options. If you're looking at micromolar substances in an assay and all of a sudden you find something extremely potent, you're going to need to override some of these options and adjust. So whereas we deal with a lot of standardized data formatting and the standardized transformation options, the ability of a user to switch and change and be able to do things differently based on what the data is telling them is absolutely key. The real big one, though, is the ability of scientists to actually get to data themselves. And we'll talk in a second about some of the technology that Satara has been developing to enable that. So again, this is the, no, the requirement of the scientists not to need to know anything about how data is truly stored, about how it's formatted, about databases, about SQL. Whereas there are always some specialists who know these things. Um, your general scientific community who have knowledge of the substances, who have knowledge of the biological endpoints, uh, and the, um, uh, uh, the uh, indications that a company is after are uh, more important used in that capability. And we don't want necessarily to have those people waiting on others to generate the data views. We want them to be able to get there quickly. And that accounts for not only standard data views, where we see most people start when they think about reporting and, and uh, data access and analysis, but also more ad hoc analyses where you can understand whether the solubility of this compound is, is uh, changeable by other information that you might have, or whether a particular cell line is producing an antibody at an appropriate rate or, or consistently over a long in incubation period. So creation of the ability of scientists to build and also edit their own data views is, is absolutely essential because the data can become available and then the scientists can use it how they desire. Um, and the last piece here thinks about the entire workflow. 
So getting to data isn't a workflow. Getting to data is part of a workflow. There's an experiment that creates that workflow, that uh, creates that data. That data is then sent to the scientist, aggregated with other information to produce a data view upon which a decision is made. That decision might be to adjust some incubation period for uh, antibodies and, and cell lines. That decision might be to send these compounds to the next tier of testing or send them to a different CRO organization, or it might be in the realm of design where somebody wants to create uh, new molecules which are supposed to have improved biological properties. And so we've got to think of that workflow and how people get to a decision. So in terms of this data agility and how it operates, we have to think of all the components of informatic systems. And the first one, and we'll see this in a second, the first one that most smaller organizations get to is a data capture system. And there are a variety of data capture systems, electronic lab notebooks, the chemical or substance registration systems, and of course, the capture of biological data with assay data capture systems. And they all, these all represent data in. This is where the individual data is created, it also involves what I'll refer to as lower level analysis capabilities, for example, like curve fitting to generate IC50s, EC50s and the like. Where we're going to focus a lot more today is talking about reporting tools. So there's a whole variety of reporting tools available on the market, but this tends to be a secondary piece when smaller organizations are growing. And clearly you do need to capture the data first, but one of the arguments I'll make during this presentation is you have to think about reporting and analysis at the same time. And all this reporting and analysis piece is really for considering data out. So I want to get to the data, I want to arrange it and view it in a sensible manner. And also, I want to make a decision based upon that data. And then the third piece, which is closely related to reporting, is analysis. And again, there are a variety of analysis tools out there, some of which you'll see overlap with the reporting tools, but many of which do not. And there are some very advanced and cool data analysis capabilities out there. But again, often the problem is getting data into those. And the data analysis piece really is to understand the data in more detail, look for trends, extracting meaning in order to make better data-driven decisions. So these are the components of informatic system. But let's take a quick look at how organizations tend to evolve through the process from a small startup into larger multi-project research organizations. So if we look at evolution here um, and think about how companies start up and how their informatics environments mature, most organizations start very small. They have a great scientific idea and they have some data around that. But that data is initially and very frequently captured in things like Excel spreadsheets. And when you've got a small amount of data, this actually works very well. It's relatively straightforward to maintain. People understand it. Everybody has Excel on their desktop and you can communicate it fairly readily with Outlook. But the situation here very, very rapidly breaks down as the amount of data improves. So as you kind of move from that real startup mode into more of a research production mode, you find that the needs change and the Excel sheets and the Outlook really starts becoming unmanageable. You end up with data islands. You end up with people thinking they understand and know this data only to find out that somebody aggregated it or combined it in a slightly different way, which changed its meaning. As organizations mature, they tend to get to what I'll call the first stage, where they decide, okay, this Excel thing is no longer working for us. We can now go to a commercial data capture tool. And again, there's a rich variety of these on the market from ELNs and to the uh, more more uh, standard, um, you know, kind of state-of-the-art capture systems like uh, IDBS and uh, gene data, down to some smaller organizations who deal more particularly with uh, beginning people beginning their research journey. And often and increasingly, these are cloud-based. Um, but very rapidly, again, that data increases. And not only increases, but a different variety of data makes itself available. So you move from, yes, I was very focused on the particular scientific problem, to saying, all right, now, now we've got to a certain stage with that science and hitting that receptor, for example. There are other aspects that come in. So obviously things like ADME, PK, PD become very important. And often the first commercial system that people look at doesn't capture that well. And so they have to expand either to a new system or add additional data capture systems to deal with that data. 
But one of the things we see here already is that the reporting tools tend to be missing. So yes, it's vitally important to capture this data, but even from stage one to stage two, there's often a lot of manual process utilized to extract the data. And I'll just provide a quick and simple example here of a, an organization that had utilized an informatics capture system. Uh, they, they transitioned their first thing from Excel. They'd spent time building up and moving data into that system, and we're now doing very well in capturing the data. Unfortunately, getting the data out it took a significant amount of time. It was about a 30-click operation just to get the data from one particular assay. And so when you think about the fact that they have four or five and increasing numbers of assays, the time taken to do that increased and increased. And that organization essentially was spending um, a full person's time, in this case a particular biologist who really did not want to be doing this work but knew the importance of it, and then project teams would not get the data essentially until a week after it was produced. So that gives you, you know, more than a, a week before you can change your decision, change your tack, and that happens each and every single week. That is a real problem, and the problem is caused because people thought about capturing the data before they talk, thought about reporting the data. And it's very important when going into a first data capture tool that you also think about how that data come out, comes out, because it will affect how you decide to capture it. The third and kind of final stage here really looks at, okay, right, I got all this stuff, and at this stage people now realize that yes, the reporting needs change, and this is where we get into improved reporting tools. But often at this stage, you're now kind of at the mercy of how you stored all of that data. So one of the things we'll talk about later is the fact that Satara has been working with people throughout these stages, and we have a couple of case studies to talk about, to get reporting in earlier, but also for organizations that are at these later stages to, for how to deal with the data that they've already captured, even if it might not be amenable to certain reporting tools. So um, let's just look at some experience we've got, and a lot of this the discussion here is based on the experience with smaller organizations, um, and particularly in different stages. So certainly um, at larger organizations, a key thing that we deal with is replacement of legacy data access tools. And a lot of people from the past, um, because historically there really wasn't a good tool available on the market, had built in-house applications, many of which were very similar to each other, um, and all of which were pretty much geared towards how those organizations stored data. If you kind of look at the middle-sized organizations, then some of them had got some of these early stage data access and reporting tools. But again, these things over time tend to get a little long in the tooth and don't adapt to the types of data that are available. So this is one key area we've worked in. But probably a little more interesting for smaller organizations is thinking about the initial data reporting. How do we provide that first level of data reporting on top of a first uh, data capture tool? So the integrating of that data capture tool does not fundamentally and utterly change the way that data is provided to the scientists. Because moving from that Excel situation over to a first capture tool can definitely and easily lead to a loss of agility as data takes longer to get to users and specifically how it has to be brought out of those systems, aggregated and presented. The third area again moves on to those later stages where thinking about how underlying data systems are changed. Often the first data system that an organization will purchase tends to be a, a, often a, a kind of fairly lightweight, potentially low cost solution that may be geared towards a specific kind of data that that organization is dealing with at the time. But as the organization grows, the number of assays, and especially the number of types of data grow, then those underlying data systems can change. And what we want to do here is say, okay, the data systems have changed, but the fundamental nature of the data itself and the necessity of getting it quickly to scientists and being flexible in that, and specifically allowing self-service access does not change. So what we think about, we think about the system as providing a layer 
between what we between the data sources and the user so the user is not particularly impacted by changes in underlying systems but instead has the same kind of access that they previously had and this really involves creating a hub and that hub is important because not only is there a single place to go in order to get to the data but it also can integrate different analysis capabilities as well so if we think a little about what kind of technology allows this, this talks to the kinds of things that we've done. So one of the technological pieces we're thinking of, and this is really provides the isolation between physical data architecture and how scientists think about it, is we create what we call data networks. And a scientist will think about that data from a perspective of a network. So the network here shows the ideas of compounds and batches and assays and individual results, and not to mention projects. This is a simplified um, network here. There are obviously other things that are of importance, like in vivo results and salt forms and the like. But this is how scientists think about it. They think about this compound has this kind of activity, is involved in this kind of project. Now, all the information about these entities, which we think about in the network, are stored in data systems. So, Every blob here is really connected to one or potentially more than one data systems. And clearly when you start off here, you might be thinking about a chemical or substance registration system and separately a biological data system. And those are great. Those are very good at capturing the data according to those experiments. But now you've got your data isolated in different data systems. So again, it adds to the complexity of bringing this data back. We can actually go further here, and whereas we generally work in the discovery area, we also work in the preclinical area. So we're not just thinking about um, particular substance type information and discovery, we're actually thinking more broadly across the whole discovery and R&D process here. And we have customers now that work in preclinical pre studies who have very different data perspectives, where they're looking at animals, where they're looking at studies and study groups and dose levels and observations of those animals that come out of the studies. And so now we can start thinking about building this whole idea of this physical data architecture into this logical scientific architecture. And it's this embodied in interfaces which allows users self-service access to data so they can get the data views out of these systems that they want without having to worry about any of those underlying data sources and how they're adapted and how they're formatted. We just want to build this network, understand where the data associated with each of these entities is, build the relationships, which is the arrows between the blobs, so we know when to aggregate data, how to aggregate data, what is the important scientific meaning of that data. So the network is built not only out of the knowledge and concepts of the entities involved in research, but scientific knowledge about how those things are related to each other. And it's really in this area that we have, a, have built a wealth of experience. If we go a little further, um, then this, this is really the capability of providing a couple of things. So the first um, is more is very much for the research groups themselves, thinking about how do scientists have self-service access to data. So I've showed this picture of the network, but in reality that turns into um, a logical tree that involves things like compound information and identifiers and structures or sequences. It involves the names of assays, the results of those, the conditions under which they are meant, uh, they are defined. And that's great because that provides a self-service data access. But it also provides a, a, a discontinuity between how scientists view the data and how the data is actually stored. Now, discontinuity sounds bad, but it actually allows the exchange of data capture and storage systems, the little blue databases we saw a second ago, and it allows those to change without fundamentally affecting the way that scientists connect to their data. Now, when we we went down this path, because initially we saw a lot of organizations or a lot of tools that people used essentially said, well, here's an interface for a scientist, and it was really directly and hard-coded to the data Data, so that when anything changed in those underlying data systems, there was a significant amount of effort required to switch over these data views and these applications to allow um, changes to a database, or even in, this, in, in a very basic level, the idea of new assays 
being created. So this architecture essentially allows you to choose whatever, whatever capabilities you need to support your data in terms of its capture and low-level analysis, while still providing that um, agile capability to your end users. Um, we've also taken a look at some of the other bits and pieces here, um, specifically uh, what data systems are used and when experimental data is made available. So our goal here is we do not want to require you to build a specific data system or have a specific data system in order to get the benefits of this rapid and agile um, process of getting data to scientists. So what we want to do is be able to sit our technology on top of your data how it is today. So it does need to be stored um, in for performance reasons in some kind of a database system. But we also want to make sure that that new data is made available as soon as possible. So we, we, without undue additional work on the part of an IT organization. So to do this, what we do is we sit D360 on top of data sources as they are today and configure it in a way that translates the data systems that there are in terms of that network that's available. And in certain cases, we will do that in a programmatic way and provide an appropriate script that locates and discovers new assays as soon as they're available. And we also create special standardized connectors so when we're dealing with commercial data systems that you have in place, that deployment is very quick, straightforward, because we've already seen how that data is physically architected, and we will talk to users to understand how they want to see it scientifically architected. And also, because we're sitting on top of the data systems this way, as soon as the data is available in them, it's also available to users of the system so they can get to their data immediately without anybody having to do any additional work. Moving on, we also need to think about the whole workflow. So data access is obviously key, but we've already talked about the necessity of presenting data sensibly, um, perhaps color coded in order to highlight values which match a project criteria or do not, to think about the multi-parameter nature of what we're doing in drug discovery, um, but also to think about how that data might be need to be presented. So. Within our applications itself, what we've looked at is what are the most important basic capabilities for analysis? And so things like graphing and charting are key capabilities, the ability to color code data, the ability to understand trends by doing regression analyses, the ability to understand how molecules and different portions of them are responsible for particular bioprofiles. Now, we know that there's also a wealth of other analysis tools out there that go further and are used frequently by experts. So the one I'll pick on here is, is Spotfire. So we know that Spotfire is an incredibly powerful tool to do a lot of this analysis. However, a lot of users will employ that for simple um, scatter plots. And yes, you can get data into something like Spotfire, but it tends to be substantially more complex. So our concept here is that we will use our work, our technology here is a hub for data access, will provide the basic analysis capabilities directly. But where we, want, where we know users are going to want to go further, then we'll provide simple one-click access to those tools. And this provides a substantial, uh, this provides a, a substantially uh, simplified environment for different organizations. So you don't have quite the overhead of supporting many applications, but also the movement of data between these applications is really key and substantially simplified. Um, and the last piece, which is, is hugely important, but, but in a growing manner. So the first thing is, when we look at this data, there are a number of different tasks it could be used to, be, to perform. So we've kind of talked fundamentally about uh, how users can get to a view of their data, but we've also got to consider who the user is. If we consider um, somebody working in peptide uh, research, they're interested in what are the sequences of the peptides, where are the chemically modified monomers, and how those affect bioactivity. Same kind of thing for small molecule research, that classic view of an SAR table. But if you look at the perspective of a biologist, they may think very differently about the data. Yes, they want to understand the assay data, but they also want to understand it from perspective of quality, from assay drift and the like.
And so they're different. They look going to look at the data from a different perspective. And this is where we can go back and look at this data network. So this data network can essentially be looked at from any particular angle. So a classic chemistry group might look at this from the compound perspective. I want a standard SIR spreadsheet where each row represents a chemical compound that we're interested in. It shows chemical structure, some physical properties, and also the biological data that comes from the execution of assays. Standard kind of data view. If you look at it from the perspective of a biologist, they're probably much more interested in the perspective from different assays and the results they get out of those assays. Is there correlation between two assays that means we're, we don't need to run one of them? Or are those assays really truly adding new information? Uh, do we see any drift in our control compounds over time? for those assays, which might be indicative of um, the science being a little suspect as that change occurs. As you move further into in vivo studies, the salt form and the batch become substantially more important in terms of thinking about how those compounds, how those substances are formulated in terms of the testing. And then obviously at a managerial level, you probably want to look at the project portfolio. And utilizing the technology and these data networks, we can allow the different roles in the organization to look at the same data from different perspectives. We can also add to this the ability to actually do, to annotate the data. And annotations are really annotating the different entities within these categories. So you might be adding annotations to compounds or assays or results or projects. And these annotations can be used in a rich variety of ways. But essentially what they are is a way of getting user information of scientific thought, decision-making into and right alongside all the information that's presented. And so when we do this, what we allow is a whole network of ability to monitor experiments, request experiments. And this is hugely useful, especially to smaller organizations that might not have dedicated systems for uh, data capture and the like, uh, data capture and assay requests and uh, such things. So it allows you, allows again, a much more nimble operation to take all that experimental data, to annotate it so it can be better understood and to monitor the progress of what's going on. And whenever annotation data is included in the system, it's always made directly accessible to whatever group of users is appropriate. And as we'll see in a couple of slides, we're also taking this and adapting it to deal with multi-organizational research environments. So more and more of our customers who we work with in this area are doing outsourced research and need to share a relevant amount of data and also requests that can be captured in, in annotations with external organizations. And having that, those kind of groups, multi-organizational, operate like one project team is a real area that we see a need for improvement in and are working towards that. So where do we really need to get to with all of this? Well, the whole point here is getting to a point where you're making a research decision. And so getting the data is one part, but as I've mentioned, the analysis tools are really important. Which of these chemical clusters shows the most promise? Where have I got good selectivity? Okay, my most active compounds are this particular chemotype, but my profile is actually better at a different chemotype. And when I examine that in more depth, what appendages on the molecule, which are groups, seem to be responsible for that? And then once I've got that, then we can think about transitioning into design and saying, well, it's not just about like taking these compounds into the next tier, but it's thinking about what are the next round of compounds that we will have synthesized and tested and where do those fit in? So moving from just this pure data access and analysis environment over into also allowing a design process to operate has been a real key change for us over the last couple of years. So let's look at just a couple of case studies. So the first one is um, just a, an organization we worked with in the East Coast, a, a fairly small organization. Um, they were involved in a predominantly small molecule research. And they recently made a transition from using basic Excel ways of capturing and moving the data around and it definitely realized the difficulties that they were starting to um, encounter with that system, particularly well, what really was their wealth of data, what did they have available? And so they decided to move into a cloud-based data capture systems, one of the data capture systems that's commercially available on the market out of the uh, quite many that are currently available. 
Um, but their key was, and their driving force, was they had a wide range of experiment data types and a wide range of experiment types. So this was fine in Excel, where you can, in essence, do whatever you like. But the capture systems that they provided all of a sudden, yes, great, we've captured the data and they spent a significant amount of time moving data into these systems, only to realize that getting data out was substantially more difficult and they lost a lot of their research agility because going through this growing pain changed a fundamental way of how they were using their data. So we worked with this organization and we, um, we, the technology that I've described is embodied in a product called D360. But for smaller organizations, we have um, a, a less expensive, simpler system. Um, and particularly when I say simpler system, I mean simpler to deploy. And we have a number of standard connections into these data systems. And for this, we deploy this D360 Express package with a standard connector. Um, all of this was co-deployed in the cloud with their capture system, so um, didn't alter any of that capability. And from starting this project to connecting to the data, to listening to user feedback about how they wanted to see the data, and then finally to train the users to ensure adoption, usually the hardest bit of any change, um, all of that occurred in about three weeks. So this was a huge change after a multi-month project to put the data capture system in place. We can actually put the reporting system and analysis system in place um, very quickly indeed. And for those users we initially trained, it, this was a, a massive change. So yeah, there was a change from the Excel system over into the D360 system. But once they understood how that operated with essentially a half to a full day training course, then all of a sudden these users were off and ready to go. Within a week, they'd created all their project views again. And now that allowed them very simple one-click access to the data that they were using all the time. At present, we're just going through the process of training the next batch of users as they expand. So people who are being brought into the organization are now just sitting on D360. Now, this organization is certain to evolve further as they expand their assays. And that really starts talking to the next case study. We're thinking about the changes in underlying systems that can occur. So, um, the next uh, case study here was a Boston-based uh, pharmaceutical company, um, slightly larger than the previous one, kind of indicative of the different stage. Um, now, this organization had already invested in, in D360 because they'd gone, they'd gone through that stage one and just realized their loss of agility and moving and having their data capture systems, but not originally thinking about how that was reporting. So as they expanded, they, they were generating new assays that their original data capture system wouldn't handle. Now that data capture system was working very well for them outside this particular scenario. So their goal here was not to get rid of that system and not to change it out entirely, but to think about an additional data capture system that would load up that data and be able to present it. So what they did here was they went out to the marketplace and looked and found a, a solution for the data capture that was very generic in terms of uh, its extension to different kinds of experiment. So it would serve their immediate needs, but also when they had other more esoteric experiments, it would be able to handle that as well. Um, and as they went through this process, they realized that, well, yes, this, this whatever new data system we've got here isn't going to be reporting. So the solution here was really just to extend D360's configuration. Um, in this particular example, we added no new um, entities to the data network at all. We just expanded the capabilities of D360 over uh, the additional data source. So all of a sudden, this new database was adding new information into their biological assay results. And this whole system was integrated in about one to two weeks. And we did this in parallel with their deployment of this system. So at the time, the data capture system was up and running. They also had all of the reporting capabilities out of the system as well. And this whole thing took about one to two weeks. And we also, during this process, uh, and then I think this was very key to the success, was we were taught to users about what kind of data it was and thought about how they wanted to see it. And so that actually, during this process, tweaked some of the ways they were capturing data, not really for the benefit of, of how they were reporting it and the technology there, but thinking about the science of how they were reporting it.
So again, um, you know, in going through this, there was potentially a loss of research agility, but because we kind of worked together and then thought about the reporting and the analysis alongside the capture, then that, re that research agility was never really lost. And this company did really not lose a step in expanding to new kinds of assays. So that covers a couple of case studies just to give you kind of some real examples. But maybe it's worth thinking about where, where this technology is going and what we're doing with it. So the first, the first key part here is really thinking about how can we simplify deploying this? And so all the time we are adding new standardized connectors. So we have a lot of standardized connectors, for example, to chemistry data cartridges. We deal with SQL server databases. We deal with Oracle databases. We deal with web services. We also deal with standard applications for data capture. So we'll deal with IDBS databases of um, uh, core informatics database, ArcSpan databases and the like. We have standard connectors for many of those things. And as we continue, we grow those number of standard connectors so we can go to more organizations and put all of these agile reporting and analysis capabilities in place much more quickly. And we also think about the methods of training that we have. So always key to this, generally the data pieces are not so complicated, but when we're involving scientists and how they get to the data, then we have to think about the training regimes for those scientists and the creation of knowledge base articles to help them get through these change of processes in order to realize the capabilities that they can get. Um, we're also working quite strongly on improved data analysis and visualization. I mentioned earlier that we spend a lot of time in the discovery chemistry area, but also we have customers in the preclinical sciences area. And there's a lot of different kinds of data visualization that are very useful in understanding data. And so we're spending some time here upgrading and um, simplifying the use of data visualization here. And again, we're only trying to provide you know, the basic capabilities, the things that um, scientists tend to use you know, more like 80 or 90% of the time. And where you really want very advanced visualizations, we'll integrate with other tools to provide those. Usually users will have experience with those tools and we want to make sure that they can utilize that and benefit from it. The big area of, the big area of expansion we're working through, however, um, sorry, which is a missing slide and there's something on the bottom here. But the big area of expansion we're working for here is into the biologic space. So when we look at biologics, and it's uh, sometimes a bit of a misnomer to just lump it all under biologics, but we're looking at the different kinds of modalities that people are utilizing and looking at. And so if we look at something like peptide research, the work there is actually very similar to what goes on in small molecule, but looking at the more of a monomeric level. If we look at something Something like antibody research, however, the workflows are entirely different and looking at how antibodies are created and making sure that data is available to support the processes uh, is really key. So we currently have um, a couple of projects ongoing now to look at oligonucleotide work, antibody work, and as we go forward, we will um, provide more uh, in, the, in the peptide realm. But we're also looking to better support standards for representation, such as HELM and other kind of sequence formats. We're also looking <coughs> at different kinds of environments. <coughs> so I've mentioned a couple of times that the technology I've talked about is embodied within a D360 product. And its key capabilities here are providing that self-service data access for the user to allow users to be agile and work well together. But also think about that whole workflow. It's not just getting to their data, it's presenting it right. It's understanding how to analyze, it's extracting trends, and the ultimate point is making decisions. And then also thinking about the workflow collaboration, how user data can be entered and transferred, how that can be used to communicate status or progress or priority. And with D360 itself, we can sit on top of any number of data sources and we can also take that further and provide automated techniques in terms of web services that D360 provides that can serve other work processes within an organization. D360 tends to be used by larger organizations. It's deployed at four of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies today. 
But we've also seen a distinct need for smaller organizations, that this is not the realm of just the big pharma, that smaller organizations suffer and, and perhaps suffer more greatly from the, the uh, decrement of research agility as their organizations change. And so we've created D360 Express. D360 Express has a lower license fee associated that is good, good for smaller organizations, especially in the initial stages of growth. But it also comes with standard data connectors to hook up to the kind of data capture systems that they'll purchase. And we also think, because the smaller organizations, that it's kind of an all-inclusive kind of package where we just include all the installation, the configuration, and training as one setup. So it's very carefully and well-known costs. But as I've mentioned a couple of times, the research environment is changing right now. And a key way it's changing is more multi-organizational research. So this means more people are utilizing CROs to do their work. They are working with other research partners, and they need to collaborate across organizations. Now, you're not going to share all of your data with every external partner. And so we've created a, a version of D360 that extends D360 that you might have in order to provide external partners access, but just to the data that they need that are part of that collaboration. So it's a highly data secure way of setting this up, but it's very quick and easy to set up and it can be put under the control of the scientists as well. And, and lastly, we've also thought about the deployment strategy of D360. And probably before, about two years ago, D360 was always deployed on premise. But over the last two years, we've done an awful lot of work in changing some of the underlying connection technology that we utilize. And now we've got, uh, we've, for the last two years, we've now been seeing an increasing number of D360 deployments, not on premise, but in the cloud and connected to data capture systems that have been put into the cloud. Um, here's my, my uh, little slide on the biologics piece, which uh, seemed to go astray, but uh, here you see that one of the areas we're working on in, in uh, D360 is more tools for biologics. We actually have a fair few customers looking at different kinds of biologics, uh, predominantly uh, antibodies and uh, antibody drug conjugates, but also oligonucleotides and peptides. And so D360 will deal with these things already, but we're creating additional tools to help with the um, structural sequence analysis of these pieces. So just in conclusion here, and just uh, some pieces of, uh, I think, information that we found really important as going through this, is the firstly is that research agility is really important. If you're waiting a whole week to get data, then you don't really have agility. You've wasted a lot of time and effort in getting to that project data if you have to wait for it. And not only that, it'll kind of ruin the investment you make in a first data capture system, because if that data isn't getting transferred to users efficiently, then they will resort to the old methods of operation, and therefore you've not really gained any benefit. So the key here is when thinking about that first data capture system and moving away from Excel, or even moving to a more advanced data capture system or systems, then think about the reporting at the same time and not as a secondary piece. Um, the analysis needs of any organizations are, are always growing and they're always changing as new technology comes online. Just the growth in biologic modalities over the last five years has, has been immense. Um, we've been a little hamstrung in some way waiting for the, the, the capture systems actually to catch up with those substances. But there are now really good capture systems for registration of biologics of different types. And so we were adapting D360 and got our first projects to, to look at that. And as I mentioned, we've got organizations looking at and working with biologics data through D360 today. And I think the other real key piece here is that often when you look at this kind of technology and the ability to pull data from multiple sources, the ability to change those sources under the hood, and the ability to satisfy the whole workflow, um, this is something that perhaps the big pharmaceutical companies have had for a while because they built them themselves. Now there are off-the-shelf solutions that they can utilize. They tend to be moving towards those. But the technology that we've developed is not just for big pharma. Uh, we've created an environment that scales not only up to big companies and large numbers of users and huge amounts of data, but also down to smaller numbers of companies and diverse 
kinds of data. So smaller organizations can now real, really benefit from the same kind of technologies that large pharma already have, and also utilize that to maintain their research agility. And finally, all of this stuff and all of the agility that we've been talking about is really to make the best benefit of the people that are on your team. Data is data, but looking at that data and understanding that data is the work of the human brain, often, lever often helped by different kinds of data presentation and visualization. But what we really want to do here is have scientists think quickly and smartly about what the data means and how to drive this research forward, and not about where do I go to get the data and how do I merge these Excel spreadsheets and how do I calculate a geometric mean and what do I do with this less than value. So we're really thinking about this as a way, not really as a technology piece, but as the technology enabling scientists to do what they do best. So thank you for listening. Um, it's really been a, an honor and a uh, pleasant to talk to everybody here. And maybe it's a good time to, uh, for a bit of Q&A. Great. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, as Dave mentioned, we're now going to go into our Q&A session. So we invite all of our participants to submit your questions for Dave in the Q&A box. And we'll, we'll take them as they come. And we'll answer as many as we can in the time log. So, Dave, it looks like we've got our first question. Your case studies that you presented were, were really high level. Do you have more specific information on problems that clients face in adopting new data systems? Yeah, and I, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Yeah, they, they are kind of high level, and uh, you know we, we deal with a lot of customers' data and workflows, and obviously there are a lot of proprietary pieces in there. But I think the uh, the, the the situation I alluded to earlier was where an organization had you know, got into their first real data capture system, and that you know, not only captured their experimental data, it did curve fitting, it allowed them to monitor what plates were being screened and the like. And you know, that, that was a big step forward for them. It was a much more consistent data capture, and it, and it, and it worked really well for them except for the key fact that getting data out was very painful. So yeah, there were some tools involved with that data capture system, as there are with many, but they're kind of geared towards checking the data that's in there and making sure it was accurate. In order to get data out of there to provide SAR project teams, and, and, and I've sat and actually watched this, it actually took about 30 clicks to get the data out for one particular assay. And then over four or five assays, now you're kind of talking about a rather tedious and painful workflow. Then they had to get all that data individually together, merge it, think about how you aggregate and calculate means or, at, uh, uh, or medians, whatever the appropriate aggregation method was for all of these assays over the different tests. And then they still hadn't merged it together with their chemistry data. So this was a situation where they were taking one senior biologist and they were spending almost full time just doing this task. Now, that's a vitally important task and needed to be done but not a good use of that person's time. And also that whole project team is waiting a week constantly for the data. So that, that gives you a little more detail in, in, in one of those uh, examples. Someone, one of our uh, attendees wants to know, you mentioned a connection of data for compound development. Is this a standard or is it different for everybody? Um, so I think this really this really talks to, to the data network. So what we see is when we look at a particular area here and we look at what kind of entities invo are involved, so small molecule research is where we've done the most uh, work here. The idea of compounds, of salt forms, of batches or lots, whatever you want to call them, and assays and results are, are all very similar. So we, we have a kind of standard template that we think about, but there's no specific standardization. There's a lot of difference in things like nomenclature about what companies use. Is it called a batch? Is it called a lot? Do they have the relevant data for, say, a salt form or, or, or do they not? And so we kind of have a standard template for that, but that template is readily adaptable to specific needs. Um, 
if you go and look at some other things that we've done in preclinical, we see similar things again as a fairly standard template because people don't work totally differently. But we need to think about how that how those data networks are extended. So it, it's a bit of both. So predominantly a standard network, but with additional pieces. Um, the key piece as we move into more of the biologics research and especially antibody is the research processes are very different. And we're in the process here now of we're in the process now of thinking about the standardization of those networks for different research areas. Okay, it looks like we have, we have one final question from our, our audience. How Actually, does this... Actually, sorry, Susan, there's, there's another question in the chat window that I, uh, I, I noticed here. So the, que the question here was, but we focused primarily on in-house data, but there's a question about can we get to external data as well, for instance, uh, pub, uh, PubMed and the like. Um, so yes, we've integrated public sources of data as well. Um, probably a key one there is the Kemble database with its rich array of information. And we've also integrated other things like uh, PubMed. In fact, some of our data, uh, our data demo data shows that. So you can quickly say, look, do we know anything about these kind of compounds? So personally, I'd like to go a lot further down here, but we, we're very customer driven and a lot of people have not yet asked about this. Um, so I think the blending of the public data within house data is fundamentally important. You know, you've, everybody has access to the public data and it's in conjunction with your proprietary data that the real value is. And sorry, Suzanne, you said there was one more question? Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, someone wanted to know, how does this technology interact with other systems we might have in place? Uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's an excellent question. So uh, the most important thing we, we, we have been working on constantly with D360 is you, there's no requirement to go off and say build a data warehouse. D360 sits on top of your data as it exists today. Um, the only changes we've really ever seen are, you know, maybe just adding indices on tables and the like to improve performance where that performance was, was database limited. So that's the kind of the, the very first pieces. But that really talks to the data. We can go beyond that and think about other capabilities. So many larger organizations have systems like assay request systems or compound request systems. And we can very easily integrate with those. So we provide a seamless workflow. So yes, the data is available immediately. We can present it in order to make a decision and then we can act on that decision by making those changes. A lot of smaller organizations don't have any of those capabilities or techniques just because of their evolution and, and uh, as you'd expect. So at smaller organization, we actually think about and try and educate people to utilize some of the capabilities, particularly the annotation capabilities in order to kind of build those things directly into their data views or provide adjunct data views. And I think most importantly, when we think about other systems, is actually thinking about external research partners as other systems and how, they, how, how collaborative research works. Now that collaborative research might be uh, simple as a test request. We can use annotations to essentially have someone say, I want to request this and the partner on the other side can utilize essentially the same but data secure interface to say, yep, I got the request, it's in progress. Or more importantly, when intellectual property is being put input by both sides. And there you really want, we want the multi-organizational research group to act like one research group. They want to see the same data views. They want to understand the same kind of analyses. They still want to ask their own questions of the data, but they really want to think of it in a cohesive manner. And that's why we're thinking about things like D360 Partner to much better support those kind of interactions. And also what we've seen in the past, when those kind of um, CRO uh, situations are being set up, and especially when people want uh, an opportunity to interact and collaborate where both parties put in intellectual property, the data security aspect of it often get in the way. And we've talked to a number of our customers that said, look, we would like to do more of these. 
but we we just we just slowed down by the necessity of deciding and setting up secure data transfer mechanisms and that's why really why we worked on and created the d360 partner product to deal with exactly that situation and to allow those things to be set up very quickly very easily so people could decide who to collaborate with when ensure it's data secure and again think about that agility of research not just being in-house but also with other partners.